Welcome everyone. Uh, today I will talk to you uh, a little bit about exceptions, um, how they work, why people don't like it and uh, what we can uh, maybe do about that. Um, so this is me. Um, you can find me at various places in the web and in the real world. Um, I am one of the co-organizers of the Munich C++ user group. So if you ever happen to be in or around Munich, feel free to give us a talk. We're always happy to have visitors. Um, in my day job, uh, I currently work as a software architect for uh, BMW, uh, which means I have to work a lot with uh, software projects that are like um, embedded software projects, um, software dealing with uh, real-time constraints. So um, the, some of the, um, the typical areas where people don't like to use exceptions very much. Um, so uh, what I want to talk about today is um, I first want to give an, uh, a rough overview of wh what it actually means to, um, to implement exception handling, right? How, how it actually works under the hood, what, what is going on there. Um, I'm not going to go um, into um, too many specifics of particular implementations. It's more about like if I wanted to write a compiler that supports exception handling, like what, what are my options? What, what could I be doing there? Um, and the goal is that uh, hopefully by the end of this section, everyone will have a rough understanding of um, what, what the options are there, how, how implementations work, so that we can in, in the second pass, uh, part then discuss a little bit of um, like what are some of the problems that people have with, the, um, with exception handling currently um, and what are our options of uh, working around these problems or maybe fixing these problems. Um, so. Um, I will be approaching this from the angle of like an embedded system, maybe real-time system. Um, if people in the audience have uh, uh, maybe another angle on, on the topic, feel, feel free to chime in and, uh, and to participate. Um, I'm by no means an, an expert on the topic, so um, please, let's, let's keep the discussion open. Um, and yeah, feel free to ask questions at any time in between. Um, then in the, in the last part, um, we will um, take a look at uh, an alternative mechanism, um, the uh, proposed um, static exceptions, um, and um, how they uh, would uh, help us dealing with uh, some of the problems that we have with the traditional exception handling. So why exceptions in the first place? Um, so I could come up with uh, three reasons. Um, the, the first one is that um, if I want to use a library that makes use of exceptions, I, I don't have a choice, right? I need exception handling support or I cannot use the library. Um, in particular, um, at the, uh, for, for the standard library, exceptions are at the heart of the error reporting there. So if I cannot get exception support, um, things will get awkward in, in certain places. Um, the second big reason um, is that I want to um, separate my error handling code from the normal execution path. Um, this was also uh, one of the biggest uh, initial motivations of, uh, for, for adding the feature in the language, um, that if, if you just have the error handling code um, like sparkled in with, with the normal code that often makes stuff hard to reason about, um, and in particular if you have um, systems where um, it is really important that you can uh, reason about correctness, then um, being able to separate the two can help a lot. Um, so this is a thing that I personally would very much like to use in, in my projects. Um, the third thing um, is um, yeah, maybe a bit of a language technicality, but still um, somewhat important. If I have errors in constructors uh, or operators, then um, I really don't have a good error return path. So exceptions are sort of the answer here that uh, the, the language gives. Um, and if I cannot use that, then yeah, things, things get awkward. So um, the goal that uh, I would like to reach is to make exceptions usable for everyone. Um, so there was this um, uh, well-known survey um, by um, the, um, ISO, on isocpp.org, uh, where they uh, asked C++ developers if they were able to use exceptions in their, uh, in their projects. Um, and I think around half of them actually replied that they had to switch them off. Um, so a lot of people these days are, um, are using a dialect of C++ where um, they cannot use exceptions. Um, and 
I, uh, I want to, um, to discuss what would be required to, to change that. Um, so before we, uh, we, we talk about the actual exception handling, I want to do a quick recap uh, of uh, how the cold stack works because we will, um, we will uh, stumble across that uh, a couple of times. Um, so what we see here uh, in, the, uh, in the upper corner is this uh, little triplet of, uh, of registers. Um, so I have the um, instruction pointer, um, which points to the current instruction in my code that I'm executing. Um, I have the stack pointer, which points um, to the, the top of my stack. Um, and I have this frame pointer, which uh, usually points somewhere below um, the stack pointer into the stack. Um, and now what happens, I'm uh, in the middle of, uh, um, of, of the code executing something, and now I, I reach a function call, right? So my instruction pointer points to this line where the call happens. Um, and uh, what is going to happen is um, I first put uh, a copy of the instruction pointer on the stack so that I can later um, when I return from the function, uh, find the place in code again where I left off. Um, then I uh, put a copy of the frame pointer on the stack. Um, and you can see the, the, the stack pointer is actually growing um, as, um, as, I, as I grow the stack. It always points to the, to the top. Um, and once I have this, um, I actually uh, pass control over um, to the function. Um, then this function might in turn um, allocate some stuff on the stack for local variables, for example. Um, and then eventually I might reach uh, uh, another nested function call inside that function. Um, and then I, I play the whole game again. Um, I first uh, put a copy of the instruction pointer on the stack, then a copy of the frame pointer. Um, and now you see that um, the, this, this second copy of the frame pointer um, that I put in there, um, this, this basically points to, um, to the, um, the, the previous frame pointer segment that I had before, right? Um, and then only after pushing uh, that, uh, that copy, um, I change the frame pointer um, to point to the beginning of the stack frame for the, for the new function. Um, and so on and so on. Um, yeah, question. What if we use a flock? Minus on each we will come to that. <laughs> so um, the, the basic idea here is if, if, if I look at this picture um, that um, if, um, if, I just, if I just trace the, the frame pointer, I, I can basically hop from, uh, st uh, from stack frame to stack frame sort of traverse the, the current called stack. Um, so uh, one observation is that um, the all of the state that is held by the current function, uh, I can always find that by looking at the memory between uh, the stack pointer and the frame pointer. Um, and the, the individual stack frames, they, they form this, this singly linked list that I can traverse that, that is basically traversing the called stack then. Um, and as was mentioned uh, in a comment just now, um, in many cases, um, this, um, these, uh, this, this segment where, where I now wrote local variables in here, uh, what is basically the, the size of the stack frame of each function, is known uh, at compile time. And in that case, the compiler can apply an optimization that it does not actually need to, um, to store the, the frame pointer on the stack, but it can just infer it because it, it knows at compile time um, how, how big this, this segment for each function is going to be. So it does not need to store it at, at runtime. This does not work in all cases, in particular if I do uh, weird stuff like uh, alloc A with uh, 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 a dynamic size in there, then it, it cannot apply this optimization anymore. Um, but it's, it's a pretty common thing these days. Um, still, it, it, conceptually, it, it, it basically stays the same. I, I have this, this sort of linked list uh, over my stack um, where each, each element is, is one, uh, one state in the call stack. Okay, let's actually talk about exceptions now. Um, so usually um, I, I have a situation like this. I throw an exception somewhere. Um, I catch it in some other function, probably up the call stack somewhere. Um, and my, um, the lifetime of my exception basically starts at the throw um, and it ends um, when, I, when I leave the, the catch handler that catches that exception. Um, so the um, 
the uh, the throw call that we saw before actually has, has two responsibilities in this context. Um, it needs to create the exception object, and it needs to transfer the control to the exception handler. Um, and in detail, that means um, so. The standard actually doesn't say a whole lot about this creation of the um, of the exception object. We had a lightning talk actually earlier this week that uh, already mentioned this. Um, the standard just says it will allocate memory in an unspecified way. So just somehow, yeah, Louis. Louis didn't call yeah, so Louis mentioned uh, we basically call malloc, which is true. Um, so, um, but one consequence of this. Um, of, of this formulation uh, that, that it is unspecified is the, the standard also does not offer a customization point here, right? So whatever the implementation chooses to do, I, I'm stuck with that. I, the application cannot change that. Um, and yeah, as was mentioned, most implementations simply perform a heap allocation. And they, they do that even for, um, even for built-in types like a single int. Um, the second part, um, the, the transfer control, um, it's similarly vague. Uh, again, the, the standard does not really mention uh, how this is done. It just says like con uh, control is transferred, but it does not say how, how that is implemented. Um, the only thing that it does uh, specify is that it um, uh, is basically that um, the, during the stack unwinding, the destructors must be invoked for, for all the objects that lie on the, on the unwind path. Um, and this is actually a word also explicitly mentions the, the term stack unwinding. Uh, I don't think there are too many mentions of the, of the term stack otherwise in, in the standard. I don't think we have a formal uh, definition of a, of a called stack anywhere. Um, but um, yeah, this this whole responsibility of invoking the destructors that is basically subsumed under this term stack unwinding then. So let's make the lifetime of the exception a bit more complicated. I can also do this um, where um, I throw an exception as before, but now inside my, my catch handler, um, I actually call the throwing function again. So um, I get a second exception thrown inside my, my catch handler. Um, and this is perfectly, uh, perfectly legal in C++. Um, and then if, if we look at this catch handler down here, um, we now have two exception objects alive at the, at the same point in time. Um, the important thing here is that if I do something like this, the exceptions must be strictly nested, right? So, um, I can never have an, an exception uh, leave, the, um, leave the innermost catch block. That is not allowed. Uh, but as long as, as, they're, um, as they're strictly nested, so I catch everything be before, I, um, uh, before I leave the, the nested scope, then it's fine. Um, in C11, we uh, introduced this nice little <laughs> construct uh, of the exception pointer, and that um, actually allows us to even extend the, um, the lifetime of the exception arbitrarily, right? So I can just call current exception, that gives me back uh, uh, such an exception pointer object, and this is basically like a shared pointer to an exception, if you want. And I can just, like, I put it here in a global so I can keep it alive indefinitely. Um, and of course, I can, I, I'm not restricted to just having one of these exception pointers around, I can leave as many as I want. So um, the, the problem that, um, that this generates for us is where to store the actual exception object. Yes? In the previous slide, yeah. uh, when the exception <coughs> pointers are stored in the vector, yeah. the exception PTR, does any relation to the my exception class, do they have to be in the same hierarchy of, of exception? No, nope. the, the exception pointer can point to to anything. It's it's completely so type erased. Point, right? Exactly because because you, you can throw anything as a, as an exception, and anything that you can throw as an exception, you can store in an, ex, in an exception pointer. So it, it's re, it's it's like an like a void pointer, or like an any. It's completely yeah. Um, so we now get problems when uh, 
uh, implementing the storage for the exception object, right? Because we can have an unbounded number of objects alive at the same time. And they can be of arbitrary size, right? Because I, I have no restrictions on uh, which types of exceptions I throw and how, how, how big they can be. Um, so yeah, um, the, the, the obvious solution is to, to just put it on the heap, right? Because they are, it's fully dynamic, no restrictions, all is fine. Um, th there's this, this weird thing that like bad dialog is also an exception, right? And it's a pretty common exception. So um, if I now run into a situation where my heap is exhausted, then in order to, um, to report this situation um, back, I need to perform a heap allocation. And that's sort of, that's a bit strange. Um, so what implementations typically do here to work around this problem is that they, um, they typically go to the heap, but they keep a, a short uh, emergency buffer on the site that is just big enough to fit a couple of uh, bad, bad allocs in there, but just a couple. So um, you can actually provoke a situation if you try really, really hard um, where you cannot get your bad alloc anymore and then your process just dies. Um, can we actually put it on the stack? This is an, an interesting question because um, like during, Yes? Just a silly question. Uh, isn't bad alloc an exception that just has a, a uh, default constructor? So in theory, all bad allocs are exactly the same. So you could just store a counter. I have 300 bad allocs in flight. Um, that, 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 that's an, an interesting question, if, if I could just, but I think Arthur has a comment on that. Yeah. That's a problem once you change the exception model. Okay. So the, 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 the observation is that um, even though the, um, the, the bad alloc does not carry any state, I still need distinct objects um, like the demanded by the call language, basically. Yeah. So uh, you, you probably cannot just uh, implement it as a simple counter. Um, but it's an interesting idea. <laughs> um, so can, can we store it on the stack? Uh, because the, the thing is, like, if, if I, if I um, imagine my, my call stack again, then at, uh, at the top of this, of this stack, I still have room, right? And while, while I perform the, um, the unwinding, um, this, this region is not touched, right? So I, I could just store the exception object there. Um, <coughs> the only problem that, that I run into here is that during the unwinding, um, I still need to be able to perform function calls. I need to be able to invoke destructors. And I have this problem of the nested exceptions. Um, but this does not mean I cannot do it. This only makes it more difficult to implement. Um, but if I really want to, I can, I can put the, um, the exception object on the stack during unwinding. That works. Um, and the Microsoft implementation, for example, does that in some cases. Um, Robin? Are talking about placing the exception object on top of the stack or somewhere in, inside of the stack? It's on, like, the, inside the stack is, is all taken, right? There, there's data everywhere. You need to, to put it um, basically on top. Above, on top, yeah. If, if it's on top, then during the destructors, the destructors potentially can have multiple function calls that consume that part of Exactly, the yeah. And, and that, that's the problem. You need, you need to keep those things apart, right? So when, when additional function calls happen, you must make sure that they don't override uh, your exception object which is super fiddly, but it can be done. Yes. Uh, can we locate an exception in thread local storage? Can you put an exception in thread local storage? Um, in, in principle, yes, but you still have the problem that for, for the nested exceptions, you need multiple thread local storages, so and potentially unbounded number. So, um, but there, there are actually some ideas in the static exceptions proposal um, how to use thread local storage for, for storing exception objects. Yes? Yes, about uh, the thread local storage. If you have exceptions there, yeah. so thread local storage, so yeah. you can use the exception, oh. but store the exception before rolling. Right, yeah. Um, which is actually also the next point. 
Um, so if you put the thing on the stack, you still have the problem with the um, exception pointer, right? As, as soon as you, you want to store it in an exception pointer, you, you, need, to, um, you need to move it in, into a storage that can live independently of the call stack. Um, so at, at this point, at the latest, you actually have to, to make the heap allocation. Um, which of course means if you are in a system where um, dynamic memory is not available or not desirable, then this can be a problem for you. Um, so is there actually any way to customize this? Um, so as we have seen, the, the, the standard does not offer a customization points, but uh, if you look at what implementations actually do in practice, most of them just call malloc. Um, so if you feel bold, um, you can just replace malloc, right? Um, there, there's, there's different ways of, of doing this. It's again, like not exactly something that you would recommend the, the uh, general application developer to do, but it's possible. Um, so you can patch the runtime, for example, you can do like weird linker tricks to, um, to replace it and then get your own malloc in there. Robin. When you say that they convert malloc, do you emphasize that they don't the constructor of the exception? No, that I, I, it's not about the constructor. It's really only about the where does the memory come from, where the ob object lives. So since the exception is an object, they in reality do new, that is allocate and invoke the constructor rather than just malloc. Right. That, that's yeah. That, 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 that's a good point. So since like since you actually need to construct an object, uh, what is actually invoked is. Um, well, it's at least equivalent to new. I don't know if they actually need to. Yeah. Arthur, do you know if they need to call operator new? Well, I think the answer they need to call it, but at least in the idea, maybe either under under TXA allocate exception, yeah. which I think just calls malloc, but that's just allocating the storage. And then you call yeah. the constructor is normal. Yeah, but, but you get the storage. Right, yeah. So, yeah. So, um, exactly. So, here I actually, I'm, I'm only worrying about the storage because once I got the storage, how the object gets constructed in that storage, I, I don't care about that that much anymore. But I really care about where the memory comes from. Louis? If, if you do that, make sure that you properly align. <laughs> yeah. Properly align the memory that you're going yeah. to Yeah. So the, the comment is, if, 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 I, if I pull this stunt by replacing malloc, um, I need to make sure that the, the pointer that I return here is properly aligned. Otherwise, interesting stuff happens. Um, and we don't like interesting. Um, so, if I now actually wanted to, to do this and, and just say, like, instead of going to the heap, I have a, f a fixed size arena, um, I have my custom allocator, and it, it just gets the storage from, from that. Is that, are, are there any problems with that? Um, so, the, the, the obvious one is, of course, that since it's a fixed size arena, it is not unlikely that this will run out at some point. Um, so, as a consequence, this basically turns each throw into a potential terminate. Um, and the same for um, constructing exception pointers. Yes? I just wanted to be nasty and say that the heap itself is also fixed size, just marking it mark it up. That, that is true. So the comment was that the, that the heap is, is actually also fixed size. Yeah. It's just that if, if we move to an arena, we make it much more likely that this occurs. But yeah, the, the general problem is, is there as well. Yeah. Um, so yeah, keep this in mind. Um, if you do this, then um, your throws take on a slightly different semantic than what, what they had before. Um, yeah, um, this is a, basically what, what you said. In practice, we, we already have the situation with, with the bad alloc. If the heap is exhausted and we exhaust also the emergency buffer for the bad alloc objects, then we can run into the same situation. Arthur? Yeah. Right. So does that imply that when you create an exception footer, it actually like moves the exception onto the heap? Yeah, so if, if I remember it correctly, the way that it works is when you call the, the current exception, uh, then it, it actually has to it actually has to move the the object around. Now I don't know exactly what the semantics of, of this move are. If it actually calls a move constructor or if it 
if it does basically a trivial relocatable thing where just mem copies it over. I don't, yeah. Um, I, 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 would, I would have to look it up. I, I, don't, I don't remember what exactly they did there. Yeah, but that, that's, that's an interesting point for sure. Um, so so this, this, this basically covers the, the first part. So the, the main thing that we're worried about there is really the, the managing of the storage. Where does the memory come from? That, that is the biggest problem. Um, but we, we still have the, the second part where we actually need to um, perform the unwinding and uh, transfer the control back to the exception handler. Um, so, in principle, what we have to do is um, the exception occurs somewhere, um, and we now need to um, traverse the, the stack frame. So, traverse this, this linked list that is, is being formed here by the frame pointer um, and check at each level um, whether there is a matching catch handler present. And once we have found such a handler, we, we stop the unwind process and, and we transfer the control to that. That is basically what we need to do, right? So there, there's one slight complication, um, and that is that um, the, the catching happens polymorphically, right? So um, I, um, I can throw an exception object and then actually catch by the, the base class type. So it is, it is not enough to just... Uh, check for um, if it's the same type, but I actually need to, um, to check for the, for the base classes. Just this point. So what I need to do, again, um, at each step, uh, when, when I encounter a catch handler, I need to check all of the base classes of my exception object and, and see if I can find a, uh, see see if, if any of that matches what, what the catch handler is trying to catch. One problem here is that exception class hierarchies are often quite complex. Um, in particular, this is actually one of the few places um, where people still like to use multiple inheritance a lot. So it's sort of, yeah, it's, it, it, it can get really complex. Um, Fortunately, there exists a solution to this in C++ already, which is RTTI. Um, so RTTI stands for Runtime Type Identification. Um, and how that works, basically, a little bit simplified, is that um, if, I, if I look at the, um, the exception object in memory, um, at the beginning of the exception object, there will be a, a V pointer which points to um, the V table for that type. Um, so in, in this case, um, for the, the my exception class, I have this V table. Um, and the V table, of course, um, as most of you know, um, contains the, the virtual function pointers, in this case, uh, to the what member functions, because that is the only virtual function that I have here. Um, but it also contains, and this is the RTTI part, um, a pointer um, to this type info struct. Um, and then this type info struct in turn um, has uh, a list of type info pointers to all the base classes. So down here, um, I have a pointer that eventually points to the std exception type info. So um, yeah, when, when I do the, the thing from earlier where I want to, to catch the my exception via a std exception reference, then it would eventually find this entry. And that is how it, um, how it would be able to figure out that it's, uh, it's a matching type. So as you can see, these are a lot of indirections here and, and a lot of auxiliary data structures that I have. So yeah, this is not very nice if I want to, to reason about the runtime behavior of this. And I think there is one more indirection when, when, when you try to find out if a type info and another type info is the same. It mm -hmm. Actually, the language allows several type info to be emitted for the exact same type. So you can't just compare the addresses. You have to use a function that your type info is the same. Right. They're, 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 yeah. So the, the, the comment is that um, the, um, the identity of, of two types cannot be established by comparing the addresses of the type info objects. Um, I usually need to like go inside there and, and like, um, yeah, 
look, basically look at the contents of the table and, and compare those. Yeah. yeah? Um, is this accessible for the user? Is this accessible? Um, I mean, yes and no. So you, you, have, you have the type ID operator, right? And that gives you back basically this. Um, but um, the, um, the exact layout of this, how it looks like in, in, in memory, that is not specified by the standard. So if you want to access this, then it's, it's basically non-portable. If I do type info of this pointer and then I put the arrow base, I get the type info of the base class? Um, I don't think the base class part is exposed to the user. Okay. So, something yeah. there so if, you, if, if you want to figure out, so usually if, if you want to argue about base classes, you have to go through dynamic cost. And we, we, don't, have, we don't have reflection capabilities that, uh, where you could say like, yeah, give me a list of all my base classes, right? This is, this is not something that the language has currently. Um, and it's also not something that people want in the language currently. Um, so what are some of the problems with this? Um, so yeah, traversing this type of infrastructure is potentially expensive. Um, also, um, this type of infrastructure is open for extension, right? Um, in particular, if I pull in a shared library at runtime, um, that can actually introduce additional types into, uh, into existing type hierarchies. Um, and this turns out is actually a, a problem in the real world. You can really mess up the RTTI performance by doing things like this. Um, if I am in a real-time system and I need to know what my execution times are, I need to perform runtime analysis, I can only do this um, if I know all of the types beforehand, if I know basically the complete type hierarchies. Otherwise, any RTTI call is a big unknown and I cannot reason about it anymore. And there is this, um, this, this big problem, especially if I uh, work on embedded systems where my controllers are, uh, have, have limited memory, um, that there is always a non-zero overhead um, for, the, for the binary size. Um, so first of all, I, I need to store this, this type info stuff in the binary, right? I, I need to store these, these, uh, the, these tables somewhere. Um, and I need to store them for all the types if I switch RTTI on, right? Not just for the types that participate in, in exception handling. Um, in theory, if I had a really smart optimizer, it might be able to throw th some of that away. But in practice, optimizers are not very good at that. The, the second thing is also that if, if I look at what is actually required from the type info for the exception handling, um, and I look at what is uh, stored uh, for the RTTI, then the RTTI actually stores a lot more information than I would need for, for just performing the exception handling. Robin? Uh, as I understand, during compile time and wait time, it is easy to identify which type's information is required. <coughs> That's why it is easy to optimize which type information to store and which to optimize out. Mm -hmm. Why do they still store the whole information about all the classes? I don't know. <laughs> so the, the, the question is like, um, it, it should be easy for, for an optimizer to figure this out. Um, I, I'm not sure if, if it's really that easy or if, if there are some, some corner cases that, that make it hard. Um, but yeah, apparently compilers are not too eager to optimize on this. I don't know. Yeah. Comment here. Yeah, that, that, that's a good point. If, if it's if it's a, a library, then uh, a user could use a, a type from that library and throw that, and then I, I need to have the type information available so that that works. So, so you mean. In, in a dynamic, dynamic library can request a type information about the executable? No, no, the, 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 the other way around, right? Like you... That way as well. you okay, yeah. But you, can, uh, you can load a dynamic library yeah. at runtime that was not specified on your command line. Right. You call into it and that calls type ID. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Arthur? Mm -hmm. I could have sworn GCC had an option to only emit, like, basically any throw needs to emit 
Right. Yeah. 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 Like yeah. And then you catch doesn't because it's just going to query the exception object to find out what is your RTP. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Throw them off Yeah. So yeah, M might be that individual compilers are able to do it. Yeah. Louis. So if I'm not mistaken, fly, I don't know about this, but Flying yeah. supports dash f no RTPI dash f exception. Right. And yeah. And they're just gonna they're gonna generate the minimal RTPI required to accept an envelope. Okay. And only for the type that you use in a, in a you know that you throw. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. These are really good comments. I like it. Thanks. Um, the the bottom line here is, an an implementation is actually not required to use RTTI for this. Right. The, the, it says nowhere in the standard that exception handling has to use RTTI to do this this matching of the catch hand. It's just that since they all have an RTTI implementation in there, they typically all do this. <coughs> but they don't have to. So um, how does the, 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 the unwinding now actually work? So let, let's say we, we found the, um, the, the, matching, the matching catch handler and now we, we basically we, we need to unroll our stack, right? Um, so if we remember our little register triplet uh, from before, um, then um, like the, 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 the entire state of our program is basically determined by um, the contents of the memory plus the, the value stored in, in the registers. Um, and um, in, uh, in this case, when uh, we, we want to, um, to transfer the control, then actually the, 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 the register values are, are the important ones. Um, so if, if I just say like at some point in the past, um, I, I saved my, my whole the, the, the values of all my registers. And now um, when I want to perform the, um, the unwind, um, I simply restore um, all the registers to values that they had further up the call stack. Um, then what basically happens is like all of my pointers now change to a point further up the call stack. Um, and then everything that, that was up there basically goes away, right? And, and I can now continue execution from from this point further up the call stack. Does anybody see any problem with this? Uh, yeah. What if uh, a dynamically loaded, loaded library is unloaded during stack unwinding? What if a dynamically loaded library is loaded during stack unwinding? Uh, unloaded. Unloaded during stack unwinding. Yeah, and uh, we have don't we do know that. stack. We I don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I think I think then you would be in, in bigger trouble. I'm thinking of an even more fundamental problem here, actually. Yeah. You still need a destructive Exactly. I, I still I still need to call the destructors, right? Because in, in this in this gray blocks of memory, there, there were actually objects living there, and now I, I just not anymore. Not anymore, right? I, I can they are they are gone now. They are lost now. But I didn't invoke their their destructors. Um, so yeah, what, what I basically did here. This is basically how um, the, the set jump, long jump uh, in, in C used to work. And it was a, a bad idea already in C because like, even though I didn't have destructors in C, um, I still might have had like, implicitly allocated resources, like I might have opened file handles or locked mutexes or whatever, and now I just skipped over the code that was supposed to, to release them. Um, and of course, with the destructors, this, this uh, problem is a lot more apparent even. So yeah, I, I somehow need to need to figure out which which destructors I need to um, to call, um, and there's um, two mechanisms how this is typically implemented today. Um, the first one is um, the frame-based exception handling, um, and what I do here is um, I basically maintain a, an auxiliary data structure in my program as I execute, um, and whenever I construct a new object. With a, with a destructor that would need to be uh, invoked here, um, I just add it to this um, to this data structure. Um, 
Exactly, and it also keeps track of the um, of the uh, of the exception handlers, right? So when, whenever I, I enter try, then it um, it makes note of this. <coughs> so the, the the crucial point here is that the compiler needs to insert code to maintain this this data structure. If I look at the generated assembly, there will be like at, at every point where like a new object is is constructed or something happens that has an influence on this, there is machine code emitted. For, uh, uh, for updating the status structure. And this happens regardless of whether um, I ever throw an exception or not, right? The status structure always has, has to be kept up to date. So yeah, obviously this, this has some runtime overhead. This, this has some cost. This, this code needs to be executed and even if an exception is never thrown, I have to, to maintain these data structures. Um, I also have an, an increase in the, in the binary code size now because I need to emit a lot of additional machine instructions that um, maintain this, this data structure. So again, small microcontroller might not like this too much. Um, the second approach is um, what is usually called table-based exception handling. Um, and um, the way that that works is if, if, if you look at, at your source code, um, then you can basically tell at each, at each line of your of your program, what are the um, what are the objects that would need to be destroyed if I were to unwind from here? Right. I mean, this this is static information. I know all of this beforehand. Um, so what the compiler does in uh, in this approach is, it, it just writes it just writes out a, a table that stores exactly this information. Um, so in, in practice, this looks like, like for, for, each, um, for each function, um, I, I say like, okay, like from, for, for this range of code, like from, from here to here, um, I have all of these, these objects are active. Um, and now, exactly, so that is generated by the compiler. And now during unwinding, what happens is I use my instruction pointer as a key into, into that table. Right? So the, the, the instruction pointer tells me which entry in the table I need to look at, and then the table tells me which objects need to be destroyed when, when unwinding from, from that point. Robin? As I understand, that table contains a pointer to the stack allocated object and a, a pointer to the destructor for that object. Right? Right, yeah. And where is that, <coughs> that table itself is stored? I mean, the, the, the thing is, since this is all static information, I, the, the compiler just writes that in, into a static data segment. So, so it's, it, it's unlike the, the approach before where it was a dynamic data structure that was changing all the time. Um, this is really like this table is calculated beforehand and then it's, it's just written into the binary and it, it's never changed. It's read-only data. Uh, may I ask him, um, on Linux platform, I use ELF, uh, format is stored in a separate uh, separate section of file format. For example, each frame and just the except table. They are completely separate from code. Right, yeah. yeah. But the size of that table depends on the depth of the stack, right? <laughs> no, because the, 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 the table is basically a mapping from uh, instruction pointer locations to these, these object lists. And as, as soon as, as you move to a, to a different section in your program, um, there, there will be a new table entry for that, right? Because like the instruction pointer changes and now if you do the lookup, you, you end up at, at a different entry in the table. Arthur? One thing that might be confusing here is that the table actually is sort of a linked list, right? It's not all the cleanup that needs to be done, it's just my cleanup and then go here and do this other cleanup and then go here and do the other cleanup. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the 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 oh, so the, the, the point is you have, you have, you have for, for each function, you, you have to do one lookup, right? For each function, you look at what was the instruction pointer when I, uh, like at, at the state where I left this function, and then I, I get a table entry with just the local objects for that function. 
And then as, as I unwind, I have to repeatedly perform lookups for all the instruction pointer values. So this way it starts backwards. So you are actually pointing down the table and you are getting more and more lines. So, so, so <coughs> based on the instruction pointer, all the objects are identified that needs to be delegated. Exactly, okay. for, for that function, okay. right? And then I, I have for, for each stage in the call stack, I have to perform another <laughs> lookup too. Yeah. But yeah, that, good question. So the, the big advantage of this approach is if no exception ever occurs, um, then this thing has basically zero overhead. If I look at the generated machine code, um, whether I compile with exceptions enabled or exceptions disabled, it, it makes no difference, right? Since like, as was mentioned, all of these tables, they're, they're stored in a completely different section of the program. They, they don't slow us down here. When, when, when executed while, while no exceptions are, uh, are being thrown. You still have the size overhead on your, on your computer. Which is my next point. Uh, I still have a size overhead because I actually need to store these tables somewhere. And again, small microcontroller, binary size, I might worry about that. Yes? And as I understand, when you say if no exception occurs, there's no code for error handling, but there is yeah. still code for creating stack frames, right? Right, but, but that, 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 that code I, I always have, right? As, as, as soon as I make a function call, I, I, need, to, I need to manage the stack so frames. And the code that generates the stack frames is only analyzed by the debugger, and it is only used during the exception uh, stack unwinding. So I, theoretically, in the most optimized code, it can be optimized out. Right, but, but that you can still do here. So this, this does not interfere with uh, optimizations like omitting frame pointers or something. So if, for example, I have multiple optimization in the code that doesn't use exceptions, yeah. then the stack frames might be optimized out. But if I turn on exceptions, the stack frames will start being generated. No, not, no, not. That, 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 shouldn't, that shouldn't force you to, um, to have to generate the stack frames. Because what, I mean, implicitly you always have these, these stack frames somewhere, right? The question is just how much information uh, do you need to, um, to keep on the stack to be able to reconstruct them at runtime? Um, and if you, can, if you can make this, um, this, this optimization, um, that you can, can leave the, the frame pointer out and reconstruct it from like static information that, that the compiler has, um, then you can still do that if, if, you, um, if you need to do the, the, um, the, the stack unwinding for the exception handling. So that should not prohibit those, those optimizations. Question in the back? Uh, what happens if when you're unwinding, one of the destructors throws an exception? <laughs> <laughs> when I'm unwinding and one of the destructors throws an exception, um, the call term. term. I, <laughs> the call term is standard. No, no, there, there's just... I mean, this, this is fine as long as the exception does not leave the destructor, right? Mm -hmm. So it's basically the... But if the destructor throws an exception, that means it left the destructor. That's but what was, what, was that what you meant, that it leaves the destructor? One where you throw it and you exit the destructor, one where you throw it, but you yeah. end up catching the destructor yeah. before you get Yeah. So the, 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 if, if you catch it before it leaves the destructor, that is fine. That is just the, the nested exception case that we had before. Not, nothing wrong about it. You go back into, uh, you know, now I have to go find the, you know, the matching of all TPIs that are going back into the table. Right. You, you basically... Right. What's, what's the, you know, the rollback needed for this piece? Yeah, exactly. You, you have to be able to perform the, the whole shebang nestedly. Yeah. And what if uh, a function call is optimized, uh, for example, due to inlining or mm -hmm. tail uh, recursion optimization and no stack frame is generated? If, so if, if you have a tail call and no, so if you have a tail call, there, there's, there's nothing left that would need to be unwound, right? It's basically like you, you basically squash the, um, the, the function calls together. It's like you, 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 are in a, in a, you are in a recursive call, but on, on the stack frame, it looks like as, as if it's just a flat call. Um, and that only works if there is, um, if there is no, uh, no state preserved between the, between the nested calls, right? So it's, 
it doesn't make a difference, right? As, as soon as you can, as soon as you can opt, uh, apply this optimization, it doesn't make a difference to anyone because there, there was no state in between that could get messed up. Okay. Um, the the second thing is that um, this this table lookup that we have to perform here when an exception is actually thrown um, is comparatively costly. Um, so in particular, if we, if we look at the, the trade-offs between the two, then the, the frame-based one, uh, the, the first one, typically has better performance when exceptions occur frequently. Because as soon as an exception is thrown, I have all of my data structures uh, already set up. I have all, all of the information in one place, and I, I, can, just, I can just perform the, the unwinding very quickly. Um, the table-based, on the other hand, has better performance if exceptions are rare. Um, and since uh, in recent times people have been favoring this uh, exceptions should be rare approach um, much more, um, this is these days typically the, um, the, preferred, the preferred way to implement with, with the tables. However, both of these have a significant impact on the binary size, um, even if exceptions are never used. Um, so, uh, the, the table-based exceptions are sometimes called zero overhead. They're not zero overhead. You will have to pay for them somewhere, unfortunately. Robin, question. On the previous slide, with the phrase, if the, even if the... No? no? Okay, yeah. Yes. Uh, the last word... No, nah, this one, the last sorry. Words you, you say never used. You mean, if, even if the exception are never thrown. Is that what you mean? Right, yeah. Uh, So, uh, uh, short excourse since uh, I actually had a discussion on uh, this, this topic at, at this very conference. Um, Who is responsible for, for performing the actual unwinding? Um, in current implementations, um, this is always the, the callee, right? So, at, at, the, at the site where the, the throw happens, um, I, I dispatch into like a magical runtime function and this function basically inspects the, um, the stack, the call stack, figures out where the matching handler is, and then um, invokes all of the destructors and transfers control um, to, this, to this point. So the question here is, can we actually shift this responsibility over to the, to the caller? Um, so, Instead of having this external piece of code that just inspects the, 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 the threat from the outside, can, can we just actually like unwind the stack in, uh, as we would during normal return, right? By just uh, transferring control to the caller, the caller realizing that there's an exception in flight, destroying its local objects, and then deferring the control to its caller, right? Um, so if I did this, then the, the, the control flow that uh, would be executed by the machine would be basically similar to uh, what happens to normal function return, right? At, at, each, um, at each state of the, um, of the unwinding, I transfer control to that block of code, and then this function is responsible for cleaning up its local state and then transferring it further up. The big problem with this is that this, of course, requires inserting code at every call site to, to handle this, right? So basically, when, whenever a function returns, I need to check, did this function return normally or did it return with an exception? And I need to handle the, the exception case uh, explicitly. So. Comment? It's similar to what happens when you make a no except function, you start the calling uh, functions from it that throw exceptions, and you don't have a try catch block. It, it still needs to insert uh, something to call terminate. Yeah, but uh, what what happens in the in the no except is actually equivalent to just having a try catch in there, and mm -hmm. then it will just use whatever unwind mechanism you have for, like normally catching exceptions. 
Um, here, uh, the, the question is more like, can we implement exceptions? Can we implement the unwinding in a way um, that it would be uh, equivalent to like normal function return? Yeah, I understand. Yeah. Um, so the nice thing about this approach would be that um, the, the generated code overhead would be more or less equivalent to what I would get from, from handwritten error return handling. Question in the back. <coughs> Because like in one of them you never have to check the return value, so like could this like mm -hmm. could this overhead be actually greater than just trying to like storing the table in overall in a big program? Um, I'm not sure. So the the question is how how big would the overhead here be exactly compared to to other approaches? Um, these questions are extremely difficult to answer um, if you don't measure, and I didn't measure. So um, yeah, but interesting question. The reason why we don't do this is um, that this only works if all of the functions along my call stack support this, right? Because I, I now basically created a, a new calling convention. I now require my caller to check whether I return an exception and then forward it appropriately. Um, and we don't like to do this because if, for example, um, the uh, function that I'm traveling through there was uh, generated by a C compiler, um, then it will most likely not do this. However, as far as I understood the standard, this is merely a technicality. Um, if I am willing to break the world and I don't care about interacting with, with code that does not know about this, I could theoretically implement classical exception handling with, with such an approach. Particular if we again think about like an embedded project where I anyway have control over the whole world, um, I don't think there's much that would stop me here. So this concludes the, the first part, right? I hope we all have a, a rough understanding now for, for what is going on when an exception is being thrown. And now again, the goal is to make this somehow usable for everyone, even in restricted environments. So what do I mean by re restricted environments? Mm -hmm. Typically, I have two kinds of restrictions. Either I am limited in memory, um, which can be either uh, RAM or ROM, um, or I have uh, some limitations on, um, on the execution time. Um, and typically here, it's not so much just about like performance, like how fast is something, uh, but it's also about predictability. So am, am I able to reason uh, about the behavior? Um, and once you get this, then you, you usually get the, the, um, the performance for free. So I, I think this is the, the, the stronger one of the two. That's why I listed here. Um, so we mentioned a couple of times already. Um, if I'm on a small microcontroller, then increasing the binary size uh, can, can be a problem. And RTTI is just a, a, a big problem here. So this is why um, people typically moan about, uh, about uh, RTTI. It's, it, it, just, it just does too much. It emits too much information. Um, so since we, we said before that exception handling does not actually mandate RTTI to be used underneath, um, if I am on a, on a highly memory constrained uh, system, I would probably want to have an exception handling mechanism that does not rely on RTTI, but has its, its own tailored uh, type identification for, for the exception handling, which is smaller. Um, I probably still want to restrict um, the, the types that can be used as exception types so that I only have to omit the type information for, for those types. Um, and as we have heard in the discussion before, um, compilers should be able to help us out, out here already. Um, I probably want to use a stack on wide mechanism that favors size over speed. Whatever that means in the, in the correct case. Again, it's, it's not that easy to, um, uh, yeah, to say exactly what will, will be better in any situations. I can always get a bigger controller, right? I mean, RAM is, RAM is cheap. Uh, well, not for everyone, unfortunately. Um, 
So uh, my impression is that uh, about the, the first two points, um, compilers are not super enthusiastic about supporting that. Um, realistically, if you want to use exceptions today, you need to make sure that you, you can at least deal with the binary size increase. Um, I, I don't think there's a, there's a way around this currently. If you are heavily constrained on the binary size, this might already kill it for you, unfortunately. So what about dynamic memory? Um, I actually gave a, a talk about this at, at ACCU um, earlier uh, this, this year. Um, many reasons why I, I don't want to do a full-scale heap allocation. So if I have this restriction, I really want to replace um, the memory management. Um, as we've seen before, that is kind of fiddly, um, but it's possible. Um, I also absolutely want to restrict the size of the um, exception type um, and the number of exceptions that can be in flight at the same time. Um, the first one, the restriction uh, of the exception types, you also had that on the previous slide. Um, that is quite easy to do. Um, restricting the number of exception objects and being able to convincingly argue um, statically that I don't exceed this, that is much more difficult. Um, I think as long as you have exception pointers somewhere in your code base that will probably be too hard for, for the kind of tools that we have around today. Um, so a consequence of this might actually be that if you're in such an environment you need to ban use of exception pointer. Um, but if you can do this, then you, you, you can play this little trick of having a, a fixed size arena where you get the memory from um, and you should be able to show that you, you won't ever exhaust that arena. Um, let's talk about runtime. Um, so we, we have this problem that we need to um, find the, the matching catch clause. And um, how, how do we reason about the, um, the runtime behavior of that? So um, as we've seen before, while we are unwinding the stack at each stage, we need to look at all the catch statements and do the whole RTTI dance um, to figure out if it's a match. This by itself is quite difficult to reason about. Um, if, if we want to have any chance here, um, then we again need to, need to restrict which, which types can participate here. Um, if I know all of the exception types beforehand, and I know my RTTI implementation really well, then I can do this, right? I, I know what it needs to, to iterate through the hierarchy. I, need, uh, I know what the hierarchy looks like. I should be able to give an upper bound here. Um, in practice, I probably want to, to restrict this further. If I can have arbitrary complex hierarchies, the RTTI is still there's some stuff that is not that easy to reason about. Um, however, if I restrict this, if I, for example, I say you're not allowed to catch polymorphically, right? You can only ever catch by the exact type, then it's a much easier to say like how long the, the RTTI will, will take. So what does that actually mean, uh, giving, giving up the, the polymorphism here? So the reason why, if, if you look at the design and evolution uh, chapter on exceptions, the reason why we, um, we have this polymorphic behavior was that uh, they wanted to have in the language um, the possibility um, to catch errors uh, at different levels of, of generalization, right? So you, you always throw the most specific error, but you might catch it um, as a more general error, right? Like you, the most general being something like std exception, where you don't know anything about the, the nature of the error. You just know it is some kind of error. Um, and polymorphism was, was chosen here as a mechanism because they, um, they, they realized that this is sort of a natural fit for this, right? Because like with, with class hierarchies, you, um, you already have this um, uh, a similar relation uh, of like a base class type being a more, being a generalization 
of, um, of the, the more concrete type. Um, but this was really the only reason why we, uh, why we ended up with this. If we disallow this, if we say you, you can only ever uh, catch by the, uh, by the concrete type, you can still implement equivalent logic um, yourself. Question? Catching by ellipsis. Yeah, that, that is the most general one. Um, That's fast. That should, yeah, that, that, that should be allowed here because it's, because it's fast, right? Because it, it's always like, as soon as you hit that one, you know this is, this is going to be the one. So I don't think you need to outlaw that. Right, yeah, but, but, but that's, that, that, that's not a problem for this, for this particular concern, right? Mm -hmm. if, if my only concern is how long does it take to find the catch handler, then that, that should be fine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Arthur, in the back. Um, when you say how long it takes to find the catch handler, yeah. you're not talking about how long it takes to walk the stack, checking all the catch handlers. No. Because there could be an arbitrary number. You're talking about how long right. it takes to check a single catch handler to say, does this catch handler handle this kind of stuff? Exactly, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. With inheritance and non polymorphic classes with inheritance, where you just have like base and derive, and there's no virtual, there's no DJ, there's no RPPI. Because then if I say mm -hmm. catch base, yeah. Um, well, no, that still has a problem, doesn't it? I think so, yeah. <laughs> the derive has to then know yeah. at the pro site when I'm constructing the thing that's going to query a catch handler. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'm looking for things that are catching derive or base or dot dot dot. That's right. Not yeah, M might be. Yeah. Like you can build that. Yeah. That yeah. Uh, yeah, all, all your base classes, but you know them statically. Yeah. Because you're not following them. Right. I mean, in, in the end, it's a trade off of how, how much effort you're, you're willing to spend in the analysis. Um, and, and how much expressiveness you want in the um, in the types, I mean, like e even with a with a fully fledged type hierarchy, as long as the hierarchy is known beforehand, theoretically you can figure it out. It, it just gets much more difficult, right? Well, I mean, I'm distinguishing. You don't need to know all of the types in the program. You can use local reasoning to say derive is a base. I don't care what is a derive, mm -hmm. but since I know at the point where I throw the derived off. Oh, okay. I see. Yeah, I yeah. Know all of its base classes. I'm done. I don't care yeah. Right, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that, that's an interesting point. Yeah. Another question? Maybe an idea if you have more inheritance in yeah. and you only catch by the exact type. Yeah. You can use the reverse memory to form the exception in the exact frame where the catch is. Uh, oh that, that that's an that's an interesting point. You mean like a return value optimization for exceptions, yeah. Interesting, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So if you want to really handle everything manually, yeah. you can catch by ellipsis, dot, dot, dot. Yeah. And then take current exception, I guess, mm -hmm. and then do whatever you want there. Right, yeah. So yeah. That's, that's a way of doing it? Yeah. Completely manually? Yeah, of course, yeah. But then type erased. Yeah, it's exa exactly. It's, it's type erased. So it's, it, it solves one problem, but you might run into others. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If you disallow catching by base Right, yeah. And perhaps have a callback mechanism where you're expected to override the provided exception type. Mm -hmm. And that, that callback mechanism itself catches that exception type. Right, yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that, that, that's very true. This is, this is extremely limiting and it, it, it sort of breaks a lot of, the, a lot of the fundamental ideas behind the exception handling. So, um, yeah, which is actually kind of the point that I'm trying to make. Like these are, these are not nice restrictions, right? This is actually quite painful. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. 
Yeah, you can you can always make an exception type very dumb and then just have it refer to, to something smart on the outside. Yeah. Okay, so th there's the, the question like, um, uh, in practice, how, how much is, is this, um, the, the, this feature um, of, of uh, having, having the polymorphic catch, how much is it actually used? Uh, I'm not sure. Like, so some, for some people it's, it's very important, for others maybe not. It's a difficult question, I guess. Um, one point that I wanted to make, and this, this goes into the direction what you just mentioned, um, just restricting the error type does not restrict the expressiveness of the mechanism. So for those of you that are uh, familiar with boost exception, for example, um, I can throw like basically always the same boost exception type and then still decorate it with arbitrary information. So this, this is always possible. Um, but again, yeah, in practice, how much information do we actually need to transport? Like, people always claim they need to put this and that and everything into into the exception. But then, if you look at what is actually being handled by the program, yeah, it's not too much. Yes. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That that is that 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 is a good point. That the, the the standard library already throws polymorphic exceptions, so it would I probably want to be able to handle at least that case. Yeah. Yeah. I have read the blog post a few weeks ago. Mm -hmm. and maybe the one who wrote it is here. Or <laughs> who wrote it. Yeah. But basically, it claimed that each time you catch exceptions, whether you know it or not, is to undo something. Mm -hmm. And what I'm missing, the piece I'm missing is that if that's true, then why there is not an exception class or use in which you pass like a function or a callback or something? Are you aware of something like that? No, I'm not. And but it's an, it's an interesting when idea. Yeah? When you do an, <coughs> an initialized um, something, yeah. an algorithm, yeah. uh, usually what you do is go through a list and then if yeah. one fails, then you have to undo everything. Right. That's yeah. an example. That's yeah. an, and that's the only use I have yeah. for, for the undo thing. Yeah. But it's really difficult. Yeah. Especially if you're in a parallel environment, you have to undo different parts of what you're doing. Right. Yeah. I think it would be useful to have a hierarchy that defines functions yeah. instead of what. Yeah. I mean, what is pretty much useless. Yeah, I mean, it, it should it, be undo or something, what it calls. Yeah. It, it would kind of change the paradigm, but it's an interesting idea. I yeah. haven't thought about this. Um, Does anybody remember who wrote the post? I no. Michael? The, the other thing that reminds like we have error code and error categories which solve the same problem but right. utilizing a different mechanism. So it's right. like an implementation. Yeah. So we can we still have mechanisms to handle things based upon generalization. Yeah. Um, exactly. That yeah. are even in the standard now. Yeah, yeah. So there, there's precedence for this already. Yeah. So let's move on. Um, The, the, this whole problem of, of analyzing like the whole worst case execution time of, of the whole stack unwinding thing uh, is sort of a mess. Um, so I, I, I tried to think of, of what an algorithm uh, would have to look like and, and I don't think it's, uh, it's terribly unreasonable. Um, I don't want to go in, into detail to not waste too much time here. Um, the, the main thing that you need is you need global knowledge of your program, right? That, that is the prerequisite. As soon as you have that, you should be able, with, without, uh, without having to um, do things that are like super complex uh, from a runtime complexity point of view, be able to analyze this. Um, the big problems is, um, yeah, like cycles in the call graph can can cause a problem, but I think you should be able to handle them. Um, indirect function calls can be a problem here. But I think if you have global knowledge of the program, then even, even that you should be able to deal with. But you absolutely need global knowledge. Like if there's anything in there where you don't have the source code, you, you cannot analyze this. Um, the, the big problem here is that this tool simply does not exist yet. And I'm not aware of anyone working on this right now. Um, I think it should be doable. Nobody did it, so um, yeah. 
we're out of luck today if, if we want to do something like this. So even, even, yeah, even if we have a tool, it, it, it might not be able to understand our code sufficiently. So what if we actually cannot get this worst case execution time guarantee? Um, and one idea that, that we had here is um, to do the following. Um, so first of all, each uh, call to uh, each throw, we again treat uh, as a potential call to terminate, right? So the, the program must be able to, to deal with the fact that like if, if each throw is replaced by a terminate, then nothing super bad happens. It, it, it still basically works. So I, I need a, a fallback path that, that makes sure that like nothing bad happens in this case. But what will happen in the, during production is that uh, when a throw is encountered, I actually throw an exception. Uh, but at the same time, before actually triggering the unwind, um, I trigger a, a timer, like a, a, a grace period. And if the unwind is able to complete before that timer expires, then everything is fine and I can, I can just go on. If it's not, I enter the fallback path and uh, I, I terminate my, my program. And the, like a watchdog? Exactly, like a watchdog. So the, the idea here is I, I'm wearing two different hats here. In the fallback path, I'm wearing the safety hat. Uh, I'm saying, um, like, if, if everything goes wrong, the throw ter turns into a terminate, the process dies, but my system is still in a state where like no one gets hurt, right? Like not, nothing super bad happens. Down here, I'm in the um, in a, if availability hat. I'm, I'm wearing an availability hat. I'm, I'm saying like if I can recover within the grace period, then I might be able to um, offer a better user experience than in, in the first case where I have to restart everything from scratch and maybe like fall back to some, some reduced state of functionality. So it, it, it's sort of two, two different points of view that I need to keep in, in, in my head at the same time. Um, but if everything goes well, I get the good experience down here um, and this is purely a safety net and it will never be triggered actually. Yes? Yeah. It seems a bit um, heavyweight to start putting real-time guarantees on certain parts of the function or process only for exceptions. If you're going to have real-time guarantees, mm -hmm. one on every function. Yeah, that, that, that was the idea, right? So I have, have real-time guarantees on everything and the exceptions are, are my last blind spot. So how, how can I fill this, this blind spot, yes. right? It, of course, it does not make sense to do this only for exceptions, yeah. Um, so how, how reasonable is this, um, this, this restriction on the safety path? Um, so the, the big problem that I see with this is that the, 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 the mental overhead that it causes for the developer, um, because now basically I, I doubled the effort for, for my error handling. Um, I can no longer use exceptions for non-critical errors because I don't really don't want to terminate like for some thing that is not critical. Um, one big advantage that I see of this approach is that it is very easy to transition to a um, F no exceptions mode. So if, for example, like you, you start out with this, you're not sure if exceptions are really the right thing for you. Um, and it turns out later that maybe you have to switch them off because of this or some other restriction. Then you already have the fallback path in place. So th this is uh, what I think is, is, is a, a very charming property of this approach. Um, and what is also nice is um, if I just want to use the standard library, um, this is actually not unreasonable. Like if I look at all the throws in the standard library and I uh, consider them potential terminates, 
In most cases, that actually works out. Really? So when you compile with dash and more exceptions, uh, your C++ will basically... Right, yeah. So, so, so yeah. So the, the comment is that, like with, uh, with libc++ in particular, and I think with uh, the, the GNU standard library, it's, it's the same. Um, they, they basically behave this way um, when, you, when you turn off exceptions. Exactly, yeah, I absolutely don't, yeah. And um, this means that basically everything you want to know is from the source. Right. So if it's, for example, a prison console or something, that means that everything is the prison console. Yeah. Right. Yeah, but basically, if, if, if I am in a path where I cannot um, afford to terminate, then you cannot use exceptions there. That's the consequence. This sounds like that in this in this alternate path you are m very very likely that you are in a signal handler. Right. You yeah. Can't yeah. Do anything. Exactly. Not even printing because printing might try to allocate memory. Possibly. Yeah. I mean. Yeah. But it, it is very much restricted. Like how exactly the restrictions look like. I think you, you get some leeway there, but it's um, yeah, it's a lot harder to work in the in in the fallback path. Um, let, let's maybe postpone the question because I really want to get to the static exceptions and we don't have much time left. Um, so the, the point that I want to make is if we want to reach this goal uh, of, of making exceptions usable for everyone, we have to restrict quite a lot. Um, so we saw again and again that like for, for many of these, these properties, we have to restrict the types of the exceptions that can be thrown. Um, we have to be able to control the behavior of this dynamic memory allocation. <coughs> we probably want uh, complete knowledge of, uh, of all the types that can participate in exception handling. Um, and for analyzability, we probably need access to the complete source code um, or at least sufficient tool support to allow to do this on, on closed source, which we don't have today. Um, and this last point, this is really a big problem because the um, because the exceptions by their very nature are sort of invisible, right? I, I like by just looking at a function signature, I don't know which exception could fall out of that function. Um, and yeah, for for the for the stack unwinding, like depending on your restriction, that this might just not be a good solution that cuts it for you. So let's do a thought experiment. Imagine you were working on a code base where you had only void functions, right? I mean, like, no, no, no code base in the real world will look like this, but humor me, right? So if that is the case, and I, I, just, turn, I, I just use the return channel for error reporting, right? That basically solves all of my problems because the, I'm, the the main reason why we don't do this today is that we don't want to lose the return channel for those functions that actually want to return something. But if, if I don't have that concern anymore, um, and I can use the return channel for, for error reporting, um, I, I get into this nice situation that I look at the function signature, I, I look at, its, uh, at the error type that it returns, um, and I, I basically know everything that I, that I need to know. And the, um, the exact kind of error that is being returned is now um, no longer determined by the, by the type, as it was for the exception, but uh, by the return value. Um, the errors can be propagated up the stack. And if, if all my functions have this behavior, if all my functions always return an, an, an error, and that's their only return value, I can even have language support for that. I don't no longer need to do this manually, right? Because all my functions behave this way and I can just have the compiler do the boilerplate for me. So it's done uniformly for every function call. And this is the basic idea um, behind the deterministic exceptions proposal. Um, except that they of course don't want to turn all your functions into void functions. Um, they just say, um, you get an additional return channel for errors. Right. Um, so the way that it looks in code is 
um, you write throws on your function signature, and that now introduces a new calling convention. Um, so now, basically, we have to do what, what we had before in the, um, in the caller-driven stack unwinding. Um, if my caller calls this function and the function returns, it actually needs to check, did the function like return normally, or did it return with an, with an error? Uh, Question. Are parentheses of the throws uh, needed? Are the parentheses of the throws needed? I think they are. I think they are. I, I don't know. I think they are. <laughs> Can you write something between the parentheses? Um, not in this proposal. There, there are ideas. Not right now. <laughs> I saw examples yeah. of this paper and there are no parentheses. There are no parentheses. Then it might actually be a typo on the slide. Good, good catch. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, I still, uh, I still catch errors as, um, as I would with, uh, with, with normal exceptions. Um, but the, the type that I catch is always the same. Um, it's this um, STD error type, which is more or less um, the, the C++11 system error version 2.0. Um, and then if I, um, if I want to distinguish different kinds of errors, I, I have to do that manually. Right by inspecting the value. Question. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's it, it's very similar to STD expected. Um, in fact, if, if you um, if you look at the the, the talk that Phil Nash um, gave uh, on uh, on this, um, in particular the one that that Phil and and Simon Brand gave together at CppCon. Um, they uh, establish a, a very clear parallel to um, the, the um, expected style error handling. Crazy idea. If you do this, you could also make it so that every function, when they, when they call into another function, mm -hmm. they give two return addresses. One return here if there was error, return there if there was, uh, uh, it was success. <laughs> <laughs> That's an interesting idea. Um, yeah. This is not what the paper is about, ask, but it, and yeah. You yeah. can ask Intel to introduce another return statement in the right. language. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, so, the, what this does for us is um, since the error is now returned through the same channel as the ordinary return value, the whole storage problem goes away. Because I just put it on, this, on the stack or in a register as I would with a, with a normal return value. Um, I no longer need, need RTTI because they're, 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 there's no different types involved in, in the catching. Um, and the unwinding is just the same as the returning from the functions. So I don't need some crazy additional mechanism to, um, to make sure that this works. Um, there has to be some code generated, but it, it's no it is not more code than uh, than I would need to um, perform ma manual um, manual error handling in this case. So, um, like for me, this is much closer to zero overhead than uh, the the exceptions actually were. Um, but we still get this this nice automatic propagation uh, of the errors, which which also enables this this separation from the the error code uh, from from the normal code. Um, exactly. Um, we still are able to distinguish different categories of errors. Uh, the syntax is slightly more verbose. We have to write a little bit more, but yeah, we, we, but we didn't lose expressiveness. Um, there are also some plans for um, doing interop with the uh, traditional uh, exception handling mechanism, um, which uh, will be very useful, especially for um, code bases that have to transition to this uh, and cannot like refactor all of the exception based code. Um, and it turns out that this can be implemented really efficiently uh, on, uh, on most architectures. Um, so let me skip over this really quick because I'm basically out of time. <laughs> <laughs> so there are, uh, <coughs> There are a few downsides, but 
Nah, <laughs> they're not really dark sides. It's all good. Um, so, exceptions pose a number of challenges today that are unsolved. Like, if, if we have some of these uh, restrictions that, that we talked about earlier, um, I might just not be able to use them, right? Like, even, even if I have the freedom to change the implementation however I want, some, some of these problems, there is just no solution. Um, we, we discussed some possible workarounds. Um, actually, some of these workarounds we, we are trying to, um, to implement uh, at, at my workplace right now. Um, I'm not sure where that will lead us, um, but let's see. Um, but we are really excited for, for this static exceptions thing um, because that, that would solve so many problems for us. So, yeah. Um, and I, I really don't think that they, they do much worse than the traditional exceptions. Um, I've collected a bunch of references here. Um, if you want to know more about uh, how exceptions are implemented, in particular about like the, the technical details of the existing ABIs, the, the first two talks have you covered there. Um, then uh, Herb gave a keynote uh, at ACU um, a few weeks ago where he uh, explained the, um, his, his proposal for the static, static exceptions. Um, and Phil Nash also gave a talk at the same conference that um, goes into, uh, into some, some more detail there. Um, and down here you can find um, some of the papers um, that, um, that describe this um, for, for, for the standardization. In particular, I want to point out the last paper, um, which um, is a joint paper for the C++ and the C standardization. Um, so the idea is that this mechanism, when it lands, will also be compatible with C, which basically means that um, you, you will get interop uh, for, for exceptions with basically every language that speaks C. That's cool. If it works, yeah, that will be pretty cool. <laughs> Standard atomic, yeah, right. <laughs> so that, that, that's all from me. Thank you very much. Um,